Welcome, my name is Derek Abbott and I'm from the University of Adelaide. Uh, this is the first in a series of lectures on this Summerton case. In this first lecture I'm going to cover the key timeline of events without going into too much interpretation. We will do the interpretation later in further lectures. For now we're just interested in the timeline. So, what is this case about? It's about a man who was found dead on Somerton Beach, Adelaide, Australia in 1948. To this day it's a mystery. We don't know who he is, we don't know his identity, and we don't even know how he died. Can it really be solved? Um, after more than 60 years, obviously information is going to be lost. There's going to be an attrition of information. However, Balanced against this, uh, there are now modern techniques and modern sources of information coming online. So, provided we don't leave it too much longer, we do, in my opinion, have a real uh, possibility of solving the, the problem of who this guy might be. So, just a, a brief word. Uh, about who we are. So the University of Adelaide is uh, based in Australia, in the south of Australia, and uh, we opened in 1874. Here's the engineering building where I work. We're famous for a number of Nobel Prize winners. The three guys there are at the top and other famous scientists there on the bottom. You may be wondering why somebody working in an engineering building has anything to do with dead bodies. Well, uh, today modern engineering research uh, involves systems and hardware and software that can be used to solve both medical and forensic problems. And this is just a simple example of um, a typical research paper that might be written in my group and we apply the mathematical engineering techniques to DNA for example. Also from time to time I get a phone call from the police uh, asking for my forensic help and one of the more high profile cases I've worked on in the past is a so-called Snowtown case that got made into a movie. Also from time to time um, I get a phone call um, asking for my help to actually trace people. Obviously this has nothing to do with engineering per se but working in a university we have research skills and those same research skills can be used to uh, investigate all types of information including finding people uh, that the police have lost track of and who would like to get back in touch with. So I've successfully done this um, over a 40 year time span uh, finding people and um, so uh, this is another area of my expertise that I can apply to the Summerton case. Now Summerton case is a little bit longer than 40 years, it's more than 60 years now, so it, it is starting to stretch my expertise a little bit, but uh, nevertheless uh, we all like a good challenge from time to time. So uh, let's get down to the mystery. When did it all start? It started on the 1st of December 1948 on Summerton Beach, Adelaide, Australia. So the deceased was found lying on the beach on dry sand where X marks the spot. And uh, to this day we don't know who he is. But the story begins the day before because due to facts that I will reveal later on in the slideshow, we know that he was in the Adelaide railway station the day before. We know that whilst he was in the station, he checked in a suitcase in the cloakroom. This is um, an actual photo of what the uh, cloakroom shelves looked like where his bag would have been stored. This is the tag that was found on the man's suitcase and it is timestamped 30th of November which is the night before he died. The K16 in the top corner is presumably um, shelf location number to easily find the bag quickly. From the time stamping on the back of the ticket, we know from station authorities that it means that this bag was checked in anywhere between 10 a.m. and 12 noon on the 30th. We know that he then buys a train ticket to Henley Beach 
from Adelaide train station. This is the uh, train ticket. The strange thing about it is uh, it was unused and found in his pocket unused. Uh, we don't have the actual ticket that was found in his pocket to this day, so this is a, a drawn reconstruction of what it might have looked like. It was a second class ticket. Uh, this is uh, meaningless because all the tickets on that line were second class anyway. There was no first class. It was a single ticket. This isn't meaningful either because the return ticket was twice the value of the single ticket exactly. So he wouldn't have been saving any money to buy a return ticket. The trains departed at uh, around that time at 10.50am uh, and 11.51am. So he could have been on either of those two. More likely it was the later one, given the time he was checking his bag in. Though he could have been intending to go at an even later stage for all we know. But it's reasonable to assume that perhaps he was going for the 11.51. But he didn't actually take that train and what he did is he went across the road from the railway station to close to where the Strathmore Hotel is, where there's a bus stop and uh, he took a bus to St. Leonard's. St. Leonard's is an area that doesn't exist now but it has uh, uh, been subsumed in an area which we now call, call Glenelg. Now that bus departed um, at 11.15 a.m. and 30 minutes thereafter. So it, it, it's plausible to assume he went on the 11.15, though he could have gone on a later one, of course. Now, if he had waited a little longer, he could have uh, picked up a bus from the same stop, departing every 30 minutes from 11.02 onwards. That different bus, if he had waited for it, a few more minutes for it, that would have got him closer to the spot where he was found dead. But he didn't take that. He took a bus that was dropped him off a uh, slightly more than 20 minutes walk from where he was found dead. So that's an interesting question. Um, was it that he was simply new to the area and he didn't quite know which bus to take to get him closer to his final destination? Or did he have other business to do at the earlier destination? We don't know that. We don't know. Another possibility, which he didn't do, is he could have walked a little bit south to Victoria Square and taken a tram to the same destination as his bus. But he didn't do that. Uh, the bus was more convenient as it was straight across the road uh, from the train station. This is what a bus uh, looks like on North Terrace, which is the street he would have uh, picked the bus up from at the time. This is a little bit uh, uh, further east than where his bus stop would have been. His bus also, uh, on his particular route, was a double-decker bus at the time, not a single-decker bus. So it would have look, looked more like the one in this photo. So let's uh, get our bearings. Uh, so. Uh, the bottom arrow there shows where he was found dead. Um, the arrow in the top right hand corner shows you where he departed from, the Adelaide railway station. On the top left we see the railway station he would have headed to if he had used that ticket, but he didn't. And south of that is the bus stop where he actually got off in St. Leonard's, which we now call Glenelg. If he had gone to Henley Beach, uh, it would have been about a seven kilometer walk down to the bus stop where he ended up going. And that is uh, almost as far as if he had walked all the way from Adelaide R Railway Station to the bus stop, that would have been about 10 kilometers. So obviously, you can see why now he didn't actually take that train. It would have been too far from his final destination so it appears on the surface that perhaps he bought that in error and didn't use that train ticket. Then we don't know what the man did for the whole of that day when he arrived in St. Leonard's. All we know is to pick up the story from about 7.15pm that evening. 
because we know from witnesses, uh, John and Helen Lyons, we know they were walking along that beach that evening around that time and they saw the man lying on the beach. Now this is uh, an actual photo of uh, Jack Lyons. What they saw, what they reported, was a man lying uh, with his head up against the wall on the beach. They observed his feet were crossed and they observed the man raise his right arm and then flop it down. They simply thought the man was drunk and simply walked on. Then, uh, roughly around 7.30, a young couple by the name of Gordon Straps and Olive Neal uh, come to the beach. Uh, they sit on a bench that is just a few steps away from where the man was found dead. Uh, Gordon was sitting on the bench nearest to the man. Olive was sitting on the part of the bench that was further away. Um, their motorbike was parked just above them. That's how they arrived. And um, they noticed a man with a hat standing uh, just above the stairs there, looking on. Uh, he didn't hang around for very long and they didn't know who that was, but they did notice uh, the deceased man. But they didn't know he was dead at the time and also thought perhaps that was just a drunk sleeping it off. Because the staircase was in the way, they didn't see much of the body. All they saw was, were a pair of legs. They initially saw both legs straight out and then Gordon thought he saw uh, the left leg slightly drawn up um, as he was leaving. They also reported that they noticed the trousers were brown. So that's an important um, detail which we will get to in future lectures. It was a still evening at the time. Straps and Neil reported that there were mosquitoes out and um, there was only a gentle breeze at the most. This is what Straps and Neil actually looked like and they got short and married shortly after the event. Sunset was around uh, the time the man was first seen by Lyons and Straps and Neil reported that as they left at about 8 o'clock it was about the time the street lights came on. So it was about 8 that it got started to get really dark. The weather at the time uh, the man was seen would have been around about 22 degrees centigrade according to this graph and the humidity was around uh, 50% at 7 o'clock that evening. So it was a nice warm evening but not uh, overly hot. Now the next part of the story is that the next morning on the 1st of September a couple of jockeys clean out the stables there at uh, 28 Bath Street. They get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to do that. Um, after the clean-up, they saddle up and take the horses for uh, a morning ride. Uh, sunrise is around 4.50 that morning and they uh, follow the route indicated. They uh, enter the beach through Farrell Street. As they're turning into the Esplanade from Farrell Street, uh, they notice a man walking away from them heading north. Um, wearing an overcoat. They particularly noticed this man because they thought it was strange he was wearing an overcoat and they would have seen him around 5.30 that morning. So they take the horses uh, down the beach uh, south to Brighton Jetty and then all the way back up again. As they're going down towards Brighton Jetty, they passed the deceased lying on the sand. They didn't think anything of it. They thought that was just a person sleeping on the beach. But when they came back, they passed the body again and noticed it hadn't moved at all and thought it looked a bit strange. One of them got off their horse, lifted one of the man's legs by the shoe and noticed that the leg was stiff as a board. And it was then that they concluded that the man was dead. About that time that was happening was around 6 a.m. in the morning and it just so happens that Jack Lyons, the man who had seen him the night before, also was out on the beach for his morning swim. Jack Lyons notices the two jockeys uh, looking at the body. So the two jockeys were talking amongst themselves now wondering what to do about the body. 
there's a slight inaccuracy in this uh, reconstruction. Um, it was actually Hori Patching that was standing on the sand and Neil Day that was seated on the horse. It was the other way around. Neil Day also was less than six stones being a jockey, so he was tiny. And these, uh, another inaccuracy in this reconstruction is there's just these horses look like two old nags. The two horses they would have uh, been training would be splendid looking race horses rather like this. This would have been the type of horse they would have been training. So uh, Lyons comes up to the two jockeys and says to them, don't touch anything. Um, I saw this body last night, I'll take care of all this and call the cops. So the, uh, the two jockeys went on their merry way because they, they had um, a training schedule to meet. Um, so Lyons called uh, up the police and uh, to come and have a look at the body. And this is the, the way they saw the body. They saw the body lying on the sand with the head cricked up against the wall. And so these are some of the key things that were noticed by Lyons and also the jockeys. Lyons has reported that the feet were crossed. However, we can't put too much reliability on that because the jockeys had already touched the feet by the time he had noticed that. And he didn't know that at the time. We uh, study the tides of the time of the night. Um, you can work out that that is consistent with the fact that the body was found dry on the beach. And Lyons reported that there was 15 yards or more of beach width at the time. Also, um, around uh, 6.45 a.m., uh, Constable John Moss arrives. We don't have a photo of him, but uh, this is the sort of uniform he might have been wearing. And he examines the body, sees that it's dead also, and he uh, makes a number of important observations about the body. He observes that one arm is by his side, the right arm has the palm upwards with fingers pointing towards the palm, he reports that the arm is doubled over, so there's a slight inaccuracy there in this reconstruction. You'd expect the right arm to be more bent than that. Moss uh, reports there's an unused cigarette behind the ear and a half-smoked cigarette squeezed between the cheek and the lapel. And it's reported later uh, at the inquest that there were no uh, burn or blister marks against the cheek. So the smoked cigarette obviously went out by the time it got sandwiched between his cheek and his lapel. Moss also uh, reported the body was cold, damp and stiff and there was no vomit. The contents of the pockets that Moss reported were the unused train ticket, the bus ticket, two combs, one aluminium, one plastic, the aluminium one is said to be of American origin because we didn't um, have aluminium combs in Australia at the time. He had juicy fruit chewing gum and also army club cigarettes. Interestingly, uh, the contents of the packet though weren't army club, they were Kensitas cigarettes instead. But we'll talk more about those details in a later lecture. Interestingly, Moss doesn't report a box of matches on the dead body. So that's why there's an X through the box of matches. That was found later, uh, before the autopsy, when the man was undressed and um, in one of his pockets. And the, the brand of matches he had were Bryant and May, and they would have looked something like this, although we don't have the exact uh, box today. Now, uh, Moss then calls for an ambulance, and this is what an ambulance of the time might have looked like. Ambulance took the body to the Royal Adelaide Hospital, and it arrived at about 9.40 a.m. Bennett uh, observes the body inside the ambulance. They don't even t bother taking the body into the hospital, and he pronounces the body officially dead. He estimates the time of death to be no earlier than 2 a.m., Although, of course, it could have in fact been a lot earlier because 
the way the body was estimated to be dead, the, the, the way the body was estimated for its time of death is now known to be highly inaccurate these days. It's not the way we would do it today. So that uh, time uh, is quite elastic. The body was then whisked off to the West Terrace Mortuary, slightly west of the city, and this is a photograph of what it looked like. The autopsy was performed the next morning on the 2nd of December by Dr. Dwyer in the presence of the coroner's constable, Scan Sutherland. They sent off body organs uh, to Robert Cowan, who tested it for cyanides, alkaloids, barbiturates and carbolic acid, and found none. So these are the key medical autopsy findings and um, interestingly the man's spleen was three times its normal size so it appears that he did have some sort of pre-existing illness. You don't get a spleen expanding like that overnight. So there's a pre-existing condition but there could have been other things that happened to him that night of course. The interesting thing is that although he had a healthy heart, heart failure was the immediate cause of death. That was what was reported. A number of interesting observational autopsy findings and we will go through these in detail in a future lecture. But the key things I want to point out now are that he had abrasions in the hollows between his knuckles, he had uh, certain teeth were missing but it was reported in the autopsy that if he were speaking, you wouldn't notice any missing teeth, i.e. there were no gaps visible. Another mysterious thing is that the uh, stall labels were missing from his clothing. So let's quickly mention the abrasions uh, between his knuckles. So this is just uh, an example reconstruction because we don't have an actual photo. I found a great difficulty finding any reports of abrasions between knuckles in the literature, though I found this particular example of uh, abrasions between knuckles done during gardening from uh, thorny plants. Uh, so uh, he would have had an abrasion, something similar to this, uh, actually extending down to the back of the hand which was also reported at the case of the Somerton man. And it, it said he had two of those, so it was on two knuckle hollows. This photo shows an abrasion on top of the knuckle as well, but this is there as an example to show you that that's what he didn't have. He didn't have one on top of the knuckle, only between the knuckles. So that's an interesting observation. It was reported that he his back teeth were missing, and yet he didn't have a dental plate. So that's interesting. Uh, he had a, a nice uh, athletic physique, broad shoulders going down to a narrow waist, and was a very strong man. And so he must have had some sort of dental plate. Uh, otherwise, how would he chew his food with no back teeth? Uh, now this is just an example of Winston Churchill's partial dentures. Uh, the Somerton man's would have looked something different to this, but uh, this is an example. The autopsy also reports the man had no lateral incisors. So these are front teeth that are between your middle teeth and your canines. And so the most famous example of uh, somebody without a lateral incisor is Tom Cruise. So notice that his canine there is right next to his central tooth. But that's only on one side. His other side is okay. The Somerton man had it exactly symmetrical across both sides. Because of that symmetry, uh, it's quite likely that that was congenital rather than um, them being uh, uh, lost by some sort of accident when he was young and then the teeth closing up. That would be a little bit of a coincidence for both to pop out exactly like that. Then the following day, on the 3rd of December, police photographer Jimmy Durham takes photographs of the dead man and also takes his fingerprints. So this is the frontal photograph that Jimmy Durham took and this is the side photo 
of the man after the autopsy. Some, something interesting you can notice from the side photo is the Somerton man's ear is rather unusual. So I noticed this in about 2009. I thought the ear looked a bit strange, but I didn't know how to describe it. So I saw an ear anatomist and I said, uh, What's the, these ears look strange, can you tell me what, what, it, what it's called, what this is? And he says, yes, uh, what it is, is his simba, which is the upper hollow of the ear, is much larger than his cavum, which is the lower hollow. And as you can see, a normal ear on the right photo shows you that this is the other way around. In a normal person, the simba is very narrow and the cavum is wider. So this is an interesting feature that the Somerton man has that can be used for identification purposes. Jimmy Durham also took a fingerprint chart of the Somerton man, which looks something like this. On the 10th of December, a few days later, um, Laurie Elliott was brought in to embalm the body because a number of people were still coming into the mortuary to view the body, to check if it was a long lost relative or not. And there was a never ending stream of them and they would need to keep that up. And so they felt, oh well, we better embalm the body. And that in fact kept going for about six months. Then on the 8th of January, um, uh, Detective Sergeant Lionel Lean was assigned to the case to try and make some breakthroughs. And then a colleague of his detective, uh, Len Brown, was also assigned on the 12th of January to help him out. So one of the first things they did was they checked the Adelaide Railway Station locker room uh, to see if there were any unclaimed suitcases, uh, which was a reasonable hypothesis. And lo and behold, they found a case that was checked in uh, the night before the man died. And so it correlated in time. It also correlated in the size of clothing, fitted the guy, and there was some unusual cotton thread that matched uh, the clothing he was wearing and which was also in the suitcase. So they felt that there was a good match between the suitcase and the man. And uh, these are the, uh, some of the items that were found in the suitcase. Notably there's a dressing gown and a pair of slippers in there. So this shows that the man had some intention when he was travelling to be around where there was going to be people. Key facts about the suitcase, uh, we will discuss these in later lectures, but the key thing is the case was unlocked when it was found by the police and it was almost new. It had very few scratches and um, there was a coin found in the case, so that if the man was down to his last penny, one would assume that he would have taken that coin with him, not leave it in the case. Another strange thing about the uh, contents is there was no socks in the case. He had spare sets of everything but socks, which is rather odd. The clothes in the case were extremely neatly packed and nicely ironed. So without any breakthroughs happening, um, on the 5th of April, the coroner asks a pathologist by the name of Bert Cleland uh, to see if he can help out and help move this case along. So this is a photo of Bert Cleland. Um, notice here that he was at Adelaide University where I work. And at the time he was asked to do this job, which was 49, he had just retired and become an emeritus professor. So what that means is you're allowed to keep your office, but you're simply not paid anymore. That's what emeritus means. The man had, uh, up to that point, performed 7,000 autopsies, which is a lot of autopsies even by today's standards, and so this man uh, was very experienced. He knew what he was doing. His eyesight, however, was poor, and uh, he was uh, getting on in age by this time, and by the time the 60s came along, he suffered uh, quite bad eyesight loss by then. This photo of him is quite interesting because it shows you Bert Cleland himself travelling and shows you he's dressed in a jacket and trousers and a suitcase but also wearing a uh, buttoned up cardigan under the jacket which is what the Summerton man was wearing as well. So this answers the question uh, what 
level the Somerton man was at, was he, uh, which, which, which class he was. Um, is it possible of somebody of a slightly higher class of the time to be wearing a, uh, a cardigan under the jacket? And the answer is yes. So uh, the cardigan doesn't necessarily imply he was extremely low class or anything like that for the time. Elon made some interesting observations. He found the thread in the suitcase matched clothes he was wearing, the size of the clothes matched. He found um, barley grass, both on the man's sock he was wearing and also in the suitcase. He found that nails and toenails were extremely well cared for and he found no hair parting. The hair was brushed straight back. He also noticed the shoes were unusually shiny, uh, very nicely shined up, and um, from the information that Cleland gave, it implies that the shoes had no manufacturer's name in them, which means they are bespoke. And uh, also, he found mysteriously a little piece of paper rolled up with the printed words Tamam Shud inside one of the man's pockets. So this is what barley grass looks like, and there's two aspects to barley grass. One are the, what are called the spikelets, and the other a bit of grass called the blade. And so uh, Cleland specified that it was a piece of blade that was found on a sock and also inside the suitcase. So this is a kind of a correlating feature between uh, the man's suitcase and what he was wearing. But uh, barley grass was, is common and so uh, there's not much we can say about that. However, just as a point of observation, um, the last time I remember ever a bit of barley grass stuck in my sock was probably uh, when I was a kid. It's never happened to me since. So it might say something about the man's habits and lifestyle. But I'll let you decide that for yourself. So the next uh, interesting bit of information is the piece of paper with the words Tamam Shud uh, printed on it. And this is an actual photo of it. It's, uh, these are Persian words and it means finished or ended. Tamam means finish, and should is an auxiliary verb that puts it into the past tense. Now, no one knew what this meant at the time, but a journalist called Frank Kennedy identifies that this is from a poetry book called the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. The media first mention it on the 9th of June, and a man uh, reads the the media articles and on the 22nd of July the following month hands in the matching book that this piece of paper was turned teared out of. Um, however the inquest uh, didn't happen until the 17th and the 21st of June and so the book was never discussed in the inquest. Uh, it was unfortunate that the book missed the inquest that didn't get handed in until a month later. And the reason for that is that the media mention on the 9th of June was a very small article in the newspaper, but then there were big articles after the inquest, and it was those articles that uh, caught the man's eye eventually, uh, and he to cause him to hand it in on the 22nd of July. Then uh, the next part of the story is uh, that the uh, body is now six months old and one of the toes is starting to deteriorate even though it's in the mortuary fridge and so they decide that it's time to start thinking about burying the body but to preserve some of the features they wanted a, a plaster bust made of the dead body so they appointed Paul Lawson here in this photo to make a plaster cast directly off the dead body uh, to preserve the man's features. And so uh, Paul started this on the 2nd of June, finished on the 10th. Uh, Cleland orders a cast also to be made of the hands and also wanted the skull to be removed from the dead body 
so that he could have it sitting on his desk for further identification in the future. However, those two little orders never happened and the body was buried in a rush on the 14th of June. Lawson's observations of the body are quite important because he got to see the body up really close for, for all those numbers of days and he estimates roughly uh, from the physique of the body that it would have been around 80 kilograms. He reports that the sh shoulders are very broad going down to narrow hips, the classic V-frame of a fit person. He noticed the hands and feet were very smooth with no calluses or signs of manual labor. Another interesting observation is he says the man's hands were enormous. And enormous compared to the man's reasonably small feet. And he mentioned the toes were wedged. And more importantly, he also noticed the man had very high pronounced calf muscles, much higher and more pronounced than you would expect from, say, somebody doing bike riding or running. So this is an, an, an interesting, unusual feature that could be used to identify the man. I asked Paul Lawson, because um, he's still alive, I asked him, um, well, how big exactly were the hands? Uh, you said they were enormous, but how, how big? And he said that if you were to put the man's hands up against his own, uh, his, the, some of the man's hands would have overlapped Paul Lawson's hands by about an inch. So here's a photo of Paul Lawson's hands uh, to show you how big they are. Bear in mind that this is a guy, uh, when he was younger, was actually an amateur wrestler himself. And uh, this photo of his hand is in his 90s, so when he was younger, his hand would have been much more impressive than that. And so the Summerton man's hand is even bigger and more impressive than that, that hand. So that gives you an idea. And it's reported the man's feet were about a size 8 shoe, which is quite small for a man. And so uh, the Summerton man's hand would have at least have been as long as his own foot, if not a little bigger. And I asked Paul Lawson to clarify what exactly he meant by which toes, because when you say which toes, the first thing that pops into mind is um, toes that look like this with a big bunion sticking out. And that, that, as you can see, it pushes the big toe across and the toes look like they're in a wedge shape. So I said, is this what you meant? And he said, no, this is not what I meant by wedge toes. He says, the man had no protrusion, no bunion. He said, they were in fact beautifully shaped feet, no deformities, no bunions, it was a fairly narrow fit, and there were no gaps between the toes. Um, so I showed it, Paul Lawson um, lots of photos of different r random feet, and I said, which foot is closest to what you saw and he this is the photo he picked out and he says it was something like this where uh, it was a narrow slender foot well formed but the big toe is leaning in slightly that's what he meant by wedged foot and as you can see this foot has no no bunion at all he said the big toe was leaning in it a little bit more than to perhaps as shown in this photo then on the 14th of June, they whisked the body away to bury it. Um, here is the uh, funeral party. Uh, it was conducted by a Salvation Army captain. Uh, we'll go into more detail about this in a future lecture. Um, and as you can see, uh, there's Laurie Elliott there, the man who embalmed uh, the body. Is that the funeral? And this is the headstone that was given to the Summerton man which is still there today. The next part of the story after the burial is that the inquest takes place on two days, across two days, one on the 17th and the other on the 21st of June. And if you were invited to the inquest, you would have been given a, an invitation that looks something like this. This is Cleland's uh, invitation as an example. Coroner's Court was actually in uh, 11 to 13 Flinders Street in Adelaide. This building doesn't exist today, but this is what it did look like. Um, 
The death was deemed unnatural in the inquest. The identity was deemed unknown and the cause of death unknown. And the case was adjourned sine die, which means without a date for a further sitting. In other words, the case is over. So uh, the next part of the story is after the inquest, there's a, there's a huge media drive and uh, lots of reports in the newspaper about the, the newspapers about the results of the inquest and a lot of talk about this Tamam Shud piece of paper and the Rubai at Verma Kayam and the papers put out appeals to the public, you know, has anyone got a book with the back page torn out with this Tamam Shud removed? And lo and behold, on the 22nd of July, a man walked into a police station with uh, a copy of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, and he said, yes, the page that you're talking about has been ripped, and I found this in the back seat of my car. So this, this is an actual photo of the front cover of the book the man handed in. Notice the book cover is quite worn. Um, and it's got what's called a yapped border. This is very significant and we will go into the detail of what this yapped border means and what it can tell us in future lectures. The book was published by a New Zealand publisher, Whitcomb and Tombs. The man reported that uh, the car that was parked, that the book was tossed into, was parked somewhere in this area here, which is uh, Jetty Road, Glenelg. And as you can see, this is an old photo from that time showing you just randomly uh, parked cars of that time did tend to have their windows left open, as you can see there. It's apparently reported that the brand of the car that the book was tossed into was the Hillman Minx, and here's an advertisement of the period showing you what the Minx actually looked like. Another mysterious thing about this book is on the black back flyleaf of the book were some uh, letters penciled in and um, it was thought at the time to be some sort of code but we will examine this more in more detail in future lectures and as you can see there, there's that yapped border there again so this is quite important because that correlates with the photo of the front cover of the book on the 25th of July the police uh, go and visit an expert on paper in Lee Street in Adelaide and they show the expert the slip of paper found on the dead body and the book that was handed in and they ask the expert is this piece of paper from this book does it have the same texture and weight and colour and all those sorts of things and the expert uh, pronounced that yes indeed this piece of paper would have come from this very book he found that it matched up. The paper was paired back, so it didn't actually fit the hole in the back of the book exactly, and so that's why they had to match up the texture of the paper. Now, um, the other interesting thing about the book is underneath these so-called code letters were also some phone numbers penciled in. There is some disagreement uh, as to how many phone numbers are penciled in, we don't have this book today, it has been lost unfortunately, uh, so there are conflicting reports. But we know that there were at least two phone numbers. One phone number was X3239, um, X signifies the suburb which was Glenelg, and this turned out to be a phone number of a local lady who was dubbed Justin, and we will talk about why she's called Justin in a little while. Another phone number apparently was for a local bank. Now here's the picture of the locality showing you the setup. So this is where Justin lived, pointed by the arrow there, and that's where the deceased was found. So the deceased was literally five minutes walk from Justin's house. And so you've got a dead man on a beach, he's five minutes from a house that he has the phone number of. So there's an interesting correlation there. This is Justin's appearance, how she looked in 1949, and on the 26th of July, the police knock on her door. Now, uh, Justin uh, 
denied all knowledge of this man and denied all connection with this case and kept very quiet about it all her life and didn't mention it to anybody until 2002. And in 2002, she started talking to her friends and telling them that she was indeed the nurse in this case. But she still maintained that she didn't know who the man was, even to her friends. But she did tell the story of what happened when the policeman came to her door from her viewpoint. She said they came to the door and they actually had the poetry book with them and they said, have you seen this book before? She said, yes, I have. And so the police said, ah, so do you know who that dead man was on the beach? And then she had to back, back pedal and she said, well, actually, I didn't mean I've seen that book that's in your hand. What I really meant is I've seen, you know, an Omar Khayyam before. In fact, many of them, because my favorite poetry book. And apparently, according to Justin, she had some difficulty backpedaling and convincing them that that's what she really meant. So that's an interesting perspective from her. And then we know from the newspapers that the police then went on to uh, say to Justin, well, uh, have you perhaps given a book like this to any person? And she says, well, yes, I gave one away to a guy called Alf Oxall in 1945, um, four years earlier. And so we'll get to that uh, point about Alf Boxall in a minute. So uh, the next step in the timeline is the police that very day uh, take Justin to the South Australian Museum where the bust is, was held and they take her to see the bust and they basically say, is that Alf Boxall? Uh, this is uh, not a photo of Justin, this is just a photo of Coco Chanel, just as an example to show you the sort of uh, way she was dressed on that day. She was apparently dressed in a very light coloured suit, something like this. And uh, Justin's behaviour was quite strange that day. Uh, when she was shown the bust, she looked down at the floor and not at the bust and just answered every police question with either a no or a don't know and then turned away at the end of the interview and didn't look at the bust at all. So it was rather odd and it was reported that she looked while she was talking uh, it looked like her body was swaying slightly and it would look like she was about to faint almost. She didn't but it felt like she was about to. Let's talk about Alf Boxall, uh, the guy that she gave an, another copy of uh, this book to. Um, so uh, the police decide to look him up to check if he's alive or not, and they find him alive and well on the 27th of July, 49. And this is an actual photo of him. Not only that, but Alf still has his copy of the book that Cheston gave him in 45. So um, this is the actual frontispiece of the book um, that still exists today. And as you can see in Justin's handwriting, uh, she's written verse 70 of the poetry book out and then signed it Justin. Justin wasn't her real name. It was just a, a nickname she's obviously used with Alf Boxall. Um, and so this is why, uh, in this case, she's dubbed this name. When we compare Alf Boxall's book with the book that was found in the Hillman Minx, you can see they're quite different books. Uh, Alf's book is a thick, hardback book, whereas the one in the Minx is a very thin uh, pocket book that is just basically like a pamphlet. It's not a, even a, it's not even a hard book. So uh, you can see that the Hillman book was one that could just slip in a jacket pocket, whereas the Alf Boxall book is not. Uh, 
the photo of the Outboxer book is the actual photo of Outboxer's book that exists today. And um, the cover is a little bit uh, dog-eared and that's because more than 60 years has passed. Interesting thing comparing these books is you can see they're quite different and it does make you wonder why Justin just simply didn't say to the police, well, the book I gave Alf was actually quite different to the one you were showing me, uh, so this isn't, uh, so Alf is not your man. But it doesn't seem that that happened and so the police went off checking Alf in Sydney. So let's wind back the story to 1945 when she gave Alf this book and apparently the story is she gave it to him in a, a, while they were out in a pub that happened to be part of the Clifton Gardens Hotel in Sydney. And the reason why she was in Sydney at the time is she was training as a nurse at the Royal Marshall Hospital. Apparently she didn't finish her final exams. She left early and moved to Adelaide. However, the hospital, as you can see on the map, is about an hour by bus to Clifton Gardens Hotel, so it's a fairly long bus ride, or 15 minutes by car. So it's quite feasible that she uh, possibly got a lift to get there by car. This is the story that uh, she met Alf Boxall on a couple of occasions, different occasions, in the pub in '45. Um, they were accompanied by uh, Joy Irwin. We don't know if that is exactly her name because this was uh, verbally related, so we don't know the exact spelling. And uh, Tom Musgrave. This foursome met a couple of times, and on the second time is when Justin gave him the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam because he was about to be, go on a wall posting, and this was a, a, a parting present for him. There's a slight uh, in, inaccuracy in this reconstruction because Justin was a very petite, short person, less than five foot, so she should be drawn a lot smaller than that and Joy Erwin was uh, a large, rotund uh, woman, so it should be drawn slightly differently there. This is the actual photo of Tom Musgrave. Um, interesting detail is in interviews, he described Justin that night as vivacious, whereas Boxall described Justin as shy. So there's an interesting uh, difference of perception there for the same person. But perhaps more about that in a future lecture. So that's the end of this lecture, giving you the basic timeline. Uh, to find out more of the details of this case, uh, I recommend this book uh, called The Unknown Man by Jerry Feltus. There's also another book uh, by Kerry Greenwood. Uh, this book is not the one you go to for the accurate details, but it would be an interesting book for some background about Adelaide and the habits of the time. There's also um, a paper putting the Rubaiyat and the, into its cultural context of the time of the case. Uh, and so this is quite an interesting academic paper uh, that gives some insight. Another book that gives tremendous insight is uh, by Ray Whitrod who was uh, a police commissioner. This is his autobiography and although it doesn't mention the Summerton case, it is very useful because it has a whole chapter on the police force in the 1940s in Adelaide and uh, the way they operated and their limitations of the time. So this is very important for understanding the the work of the police in its context of the time. So that's the uh, end of this lecture. If, uh, if you would like to help in any way, we do encourage crowdsourced research, um, a good source to go to, uh, to look for open questions is this website here. But if that's not your thing and you prefer to help by supporting with funding, uh, because research of this nature does uh, draw on a lot of resources and funds are needed, 
look at the Indiegogo website where from time to time we will do a drive for funding. If you don't want to do that but want to support us uh, in another way, uh, the best way to support us is uh, to go to change.org where, where there is a petition to exhume uh, the body of the summit of man where we can do modern forensic tests and hopefully a bone isotope test that can give us location information and perhaps even give us information about where the man was born. So this would be very important for his identification. So please sign this petition if you'd like to support this ongoing work. These are my contact details. Thank you very much and look out for the following videos with more lectures.